The following is a presentation from the 8th Annual Humanities Days at Montgomery College. Together Apart, Creating Spaces for Understanding and Reimagining Society. Due to the 2020 pandemic, all presentations were conducted through Zoom. To learn more about Humanities Days at Montgomery College and to access other program recordings, please go to this website. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. Again, I'm Angela Lanier, and I work at the college as an instructional designer, but in my non-MC life, I spend most of my free time doing something with quilts, whether it's making quilts, looking at quilts, researching quilts, talking to people about quilts. So I'm excited to now be able to merge quilting and the work that I do here at the college into one space. So just to um, give you a sense of what we're going to do today, um, our first outcome is we're going to talk about this idea of craftivism and hopefully by the end of the session you'll be able to think about and identify some examples of craftivism. Secondly, um, you'll be able to explain why quilts are good tools to use for activism and social justice. And last, I hope by the end of the session you'll be able to describe at least two quilts um, that were used to promote some, some form of social justice. So first thing, this term craftivism um, is probably not surprising uh, just when you look at the term. It's a combination of craft and activism. And it's people using their craft, working with their hands, creating something from scratch that they're actually using for some cause, some social issue to speak about some injustice or some cause. And that term was first popularized, I won't say uh, created by, but popularized by a blogger and activist by the name of Betsy Greer. And I've linked to a video here about her and where she walks through an, an activity or project that she did where she used craft and needlepoint to sort of spread, um, spread like positive messages in her community. And so I, I will make this presentation available so that you can actually watch that video. So that was back in 2003. And she talks about three different time, types of craftivism. One is donation. And that can be anything from creating something that you donate for people in need to use. Um, and that could be things like creating a quilt for the homeless or creating a quilt for people living in a shelter. It could also mean creating a quilt or creating um, items that are used as a fundraiser to raise money for a particular cause. The second one is beautification. And this is what we see in sometimes when you might see a mural that's created on the side of a wall that speaks to a particular issue or that reflects something happening in a particular neighborhood. So even though it's used for, some people will look at it and say, oh, it's beautiful, it's decoration it's actually serving some sort of a purpose or a cause as well. And it can also mean that it was created with people who were trying to work towards a cause, even though the, the item itself might be used for beautification, bringing them together to work on this was for a particular reason. And the third is notification. And that's probably the most common form because using crafts to notify or teach people about something is a way of building awareness and getting them to stop and think and reflect on, on a particular issue or a cause uh, that they want to draw attention to or cause people, lead people to some sort of action. So that just gives you a little bit about that term craftivism. So if you hear it again, uh, you'll understand what that means. So why are quilts good tools to use for social justice? Um, one reason I've identified is portability. So one of my favorite um, artists is a woman by the name of Faith Ringgold. And she was, uh, grew up during the time of the Harlem Renaissance, ended up studying art, became an art teacher, became a very active artist, and spent a lot of her years creating art, including quilts, that spoke to so certain issues and certain themes and social justice, particularly during the 60s and 70s. So she talked about, at one point, she would create these very big, almost life-size paintings, but when she's traveling around and trying to get people to look at her work, it's very difficult to take a six-foot painting and put it in your car and take it to the next place. 
So her mo mother, who was a fashion designer, encouraged her to start using canvas and fabric as using fabric as her canvas. And that made it so much easier to take it to different places. So quilts are portable. They can be folded, they can be rolled up. They're much easier to mail than say a five, six, seven foot uh, canvas of painting. Secondly is the visual impact. And this in combination with portability makes it a good tool to use for social justice. So we know that any type of visual art can have an impact on people when they see it. But there's something about quilts, again, because you can take it to so many different places and the way quilts are structured, they can actually tell a story. You can create separate blocks and each block can have a scene or a story. And, and so it's the ability to have that visual impact that does more than just depict one thing, but it can have several things in it. Just the very nature of the layout of a quilt. Next is that connection to home, the familiar, healing, comfort. Whenever I meet people and I mention that I'm a quilter, almost without fail, 100% of the time, they say to me, oh, my mother used to quilt, my grandmother used to quilt, I have a neighbor who quilted, I had a teacher who quilted and used to have a quilt in the office. So almost everyone has some kind of connection to quilts in some way. They know what it is, it's familiar, and usually they have some memory of being in someone's home, sleeping under a quilt, a very heavy quilt that they were able to keep warm under in the winter. So having that connection with something familiar, something comforting, um, really does give, um, give people a, a place to start talking about something, even when it's a difficult subject. And that takes me to the next point. This is a quote um, from, or a term, or a phrase used by Carolyn Maslumi, who is a, um, a master quilter who, is, who has curated many exhibits around the country and the world uh, that speak to social issues. And she uses this, this expression, quilts are a soft place to land. And she, what she meant by that is, you can talk about these very difficult subjects, challenging subjects, controversial subjects, but when it's all in a quilt, when quilting is the place that you start, um, it sort of softens or eases uh, the conversation in the beginning so you can start to have those difficult conversations. And I think that's very powerful. So these two go hand in hand. The last thing is quilts give people the opportunity to have multiple contributors. You can collaborate on a quilt. It's very rare that you see someone, um, a painting where you say, oh, these 10 people contribute to this one painting. It's possible, but it's not, not very widespread. That's not the case with quilts. Just the nature of quilts, because you can create them in segments, different people can, can create the segments and then you can bring them together as a whole and it's still cohesive. And we'll look at several examples of that throughout this presentation. So before I move on and get into the quilts, are there any questions so far? I don't know, Sarah, if anything is written in the chat yet or any questions? No, no questions yet. Okay. But uh, um, audience, please do write in the chat and we'll do summaries along the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, so. The first quilt, and we're gonna go through nine quilts. I'm gonna cover them in chronological order, starting from the one that was created the earliest, and we'll talk a little bit about the different styles of those quilts. Okay, so here's the first one. This quilt is called Women's Rights Quilt. Um, it was not named when it was created. Uh, that's the name that I believe was given to it retroactively. Uh, it's about 70 inches by 70 inches, and it's been attributed to um, Emma Stahl, um, and it's been dated 1875. Um, I tried to do a little research on this creator, didn't find a whole lot of information, but was uh, read in a few places that she would have been born in 1860, which would have made her about 15 years old when she created this. So I'm not sure if that's accurate, but it's not uncommon that young women would have been engaged in the needle arts and would have created something like this. 
at first glance, you've probably noticed this motif around the borders, you see the flowers, you see the birds, and you also see these little circles with scenes of people. Um, this quote was created several years after the Civil War, and there's some um, speculation that some of the scenes like this one that are attributed to soldiers and the war was, was, was to honor that. But what, what's most compelling about this quote is what we'll see in these sections here that I've just highlighted. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit closer view here. In this particular scene, you see a woman here, and she's got a banner thrown over her shoulder. And here's a man in an apron, and he's pointing, and a child in front of them. So when I, I first saw this, I said, what is he telling her? Is he telling her to get out? Is he telling her to go do something? What's happening in this scene? So the next scene, she's riding off on the horse, and she's, you can see the banner now says woman, and it looks like it's starting to spell out rights. This next scene here, she's standing on a podium talking to, influencing, maybe even encouraging a group of women or a group of people. And, oops, sorry, went too far. And then in this last scene, you see the man at home at the table doing the housework, still with his apron, child on the floor, the broom, and it looks kind of a mess, but still um, that goes along with the, the message in this. So even though this quilt is, is speaking to and advocating for women's rights, it does so in somewhat of a humorous way, um, but it also uh, has some attributes or gives some homage to the soldiers. It has elements of very traditional quilts with all the motifs and the flowers and the birds and the stars and things like that. So at first glance, if you were to look at this quilt from far away, you probably wouldn't notice these scenes here. Um, but the, what the quilter did was put those things in almost very subtly yet it tells a story and it's pretty bold. So this person is very clearly speaking out on and advocating for women's rights, but did it in a way that was subtle and didn't hit you in the face at first glance. But as you get closer and look in more detail at the quilt, you'll start to see that message. That goes back to that idea of quilts being a soft place to land. So again, you walk up on this quilt, you see it, you might admire it for the beauty and the detail and the work, and then you get closer and you go, whoa, this is more than just a bed covering or a wall hanging. This quilt actually has a message here. Okay. This second quilt here is called the Freedom Quilt, and it was created by Jesse Bell Williams Telfair in 1975. Jesse Bell Williams, um, was a cafeteria worker at an elementary school in southwest Georgia. And in the 1950s, 60s, I believe, when uh, members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee were in town, they were trying to get African Americans in particular to register to vote. She, I don't know if she actually did register or if she attempted to register, but once her employer found out, she was fired from her job. And that was very common. Um, with people who did not want blacks, Black people to vote, they would, could lose their job and possibly their lives if they did so or even organized, or even if there was a sense that they were going to register. So during that time, she lost her job. And obviously that was a sense of violating her, her civil rights. Well, I, I wasn't able to find much about what happened to her in the meantime, but in 1975, she created this quilt. And it speaks to a time where maybe she felt like, finally, I'm free of this. Finally, I have my rights. Unlike the previous quilt, this one isn't subtle. <laughs> it's very clear that she's sending this message of freedom. Not only does she put it very boldly in large letters, it's repeated <laughs> up and down the quilt. It's the focus of the quilt. So it's a very bold statement. Um, the other thing is this quilt, this uh, artist actually made this same quilt almost identical three times. So this particular version is in the National Museum of African American History and Culture. There's another one in the Folk Art Museum in New York. And then a third one that's in a museum in Georgia, I think it's called the uh, Museum of High Art, I think is what it's called. So not only did she make it and make this bold statement, she made it three times. <laughs> I also want to note that um, the civil rights era was a very um, um, 
powerful and very polarizing era in the United States. And I tried to look for examples of quilts that were created about civil rights during the civil rights era, and I have yet to find any. Um, so my guess is that during that time, um, you, you don't see a lot of quilts that are dated in the 50s and 60s that speak to civil rights, partly because I'm assuming if people did create quilts during that time, it was because they needed to create them for practical reasons. Another reason could be that just like she was fired from her job just for registering to vote, imagine what would happen if someone spent time on a quilt that spoke to that theme or that message and someone found out not only would something happen to the quilt, something could happen to them. So you see a lot of civil rights themes quilts now, but many of them were created after the end of the civil rights movement, or you see many of them in recent years that are commemorating certain milestones or anniversaries about things that happened during the civil rights movement. But I wasn't able to find any quilts. They could be out there, but I wasn't able to find any quilts that specifically spoke to civil rights that were created during that era. Okay. This next quilt is called the National Peace Quilt, and it's pretty big, more than 100 inches wide and um, in length. This quilt was created by um, a group of women uh, that go under the name the Boise Quilt Peace Quilt Project. Initially, two women who live in Idaho who were friends were in church talking one day, and they were talking about the story of um, a woman whose family was impacted by cancer due to the nuclear testing in Utah. And they said, we should do something. And so they created a quilt and they sent it to uh, the Soviet Union and connected with a group of women in some sort of a women's group in the Soviet Union and started a, an exchange or a friendship with those women. After that, they got the idea to keep creating these peace quilts, these peace quilts that have different themes. This one was created in 1984, and it's an example of a collaboration. So several women worked on the quilt. Each of the blocks is designed based on a children's drawing, which was transferred onto fabric. And there are 50 blocks that represent the 50 states. Um, after the quilt was created and put together and quilted, they said, what if we sent this quilt to Congress as a way of getting them to think about and encourage them to think about peace in what they do? So they sent this quilt to the senators, the US senators, which there were a hundred of them, and they asked them each to spend one night sleeping under this quilt and the next day write in a log, how did you feel? What was this experience like? Imagine peace and what that is. So if you could see here, it says rest. They want them to rest under the quilt, dream, sort of think about a world of peace, and then act, do something about it in your position. So this is an example of a quilt that wasn't just created to look nice, it wasn't just created to share, it was created to sort of encourage people to do something, to act. And so that to me is, is the very, um, that epitomizes what it means to quilt for a cause. Um, I'm from Washington, D.C. originally, so I'm a little salty that there's nothing in it that represents D.C., but I understand <laughs> what, what, why that is. And in case anybody was wondering, here's a close-up of the block that represents Maryland. No surprises. Okay. This next example, some of you may have seen, and I believe we have some examples of this or a photo or two of this in a lot of the Humanities Days of, of promotional materials that, we sent, that were sent out. This is one block from the AIDS Memorial Quilt. And if you're familiar with the AIDS Memorial Quilt, it is massive. And it's not one big quilt, it's several panels that were then stitched together to make blocks um, that are often travel together and are laid out to, to appear to be one large quilt. So in, 
in the in, in 1987, a man by the name of Cleve Jones, he was made the first panel. He was an activist who had several close family members or friends rather, who died of the AIDS virus. And one of the things he decided to do was to find a way to recognize and memorialize them. Um, so the AIDS quilt, memorial quilt, consists of, I believe the latest count was just over 50,000 panels. Um, this area right here is considered one panel. And each panel is three feet wide, six feet long. So you can't tell from this picture, but each individual panel is actually pretty big. So the reason they chose that size is because they said it roughly resembles the size of a coffin. So what they would do is as individuals would create a panel to recognize, memorialize their friend or loved one uh, who passed away of the AIDS virus, and they would take eight of these panels and stitch them together into a, what's called a block. So this block will now measure 12 feet by 12 feet. And they just kept creating these. The original um, AIDS Memorial Quilt had about 15 to 18,000 panels. I'm sorry, 15 to 1,800 panels. And then it grew and grew and grew and grew. And every year they would get more. Um, we've seen photos of them laid out. I think I have a photo here of them laid out on the National Mall. Uh, the AIDS Memorial Quilt has come to the National Mall several times. I believe the last time was in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. And what they would do is they would lay out all these panels, maybe 15, 12, 1500 of them. At the end of the day, they would take them up and then they would rotate another set of panels. So if you went down on different days, you would not have seen the same panels. And if you can imagine the magnitude of these covering the entire mall, maybe some of you have seen it in person. Unfortunately, I had not. Um, but it, it just makes a bold statement about the impact that this virus had on our nation, um, and on the world, really. Angela, why don't, yes. why don't I read just a few of the comments? I won't go long, mm -hmm. but um, okay. because we do have people in the audience who saw okay. it. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, um, if, you, this, if you have never seen the AIDS quilt, it's difficult to imagine how powerful it is. The AIDS quilt is now too large to display altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol Moore says, yes, it is massive and so powerful. Greg Wall mentions, I didn't know about the three foot by six foot size, which you've just told us is to um, really the size of the gravesite or um, casket, which mm -hmm. I have forgotten as well, but how that just blows me away. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Ross says, I remember seeing it on the mall when it was first displayed. Now it's so large, it can't be displayed anymore. So very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, Nigel says, that's beautiful and sobering, Lynn uh, mm -hmm. adds in. And then I mentioned that I um, did see the, I, I started to look. Once I got there, I realized that my friend from childhood, Carrie, might be there. Mm -hmm. um, but um, after that, I wrote a letter to his parents. And that was the first time that, that we ever had a conversation about why Carrie might be a, on that um, mm -hmm. on a quilt. Uh, mm -hmm. Greg says, it was amazing to see in person. And Denise says, seeing the AIDS quilt on the mall was very moving. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Lynn says, it's like the Vietnam Memorial Wall in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I'm, a, I'm sorry, is it Rosa Ross, but um, says, uh, imagine we could create this for COVID. And I so mm -hmm. agree. All right. I want to mm -hmm. let you get back to your um, presentation. No, thank you. So, thank you for sharing those. So, yeah, just, and, and when you think about, and this is the, the thing about, and we'll see an, another example of this in this um, presentation, but can you imagine when you start off with something small and simple that's really recognizing what's around you, person, what impacts you personally, and then it just goes viral. And keep in mind, this was the 80s, so we didn't have social media back then, but people were finding out about this and, and contributing. And, and that says something about the power of what we're able to do and how it started organically on the ground with individuals and look at where it is now. Um, I think the, the quilt actually, or the, the panels now are, they were in housed somewhere at a museum in Georgia for a while. Now I'm told they are, they've been moved to San Francisco to the, I think it's the AIDS Memorial Organization in, in San Francisco and that will be its permanent home. 
which is which is appropriate since that's where it where it all started. Okay. This next um, quilt, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm actually going to play the video and let this, where the artist gets to talk about it. This one was created by Therese Agnew and it speaks to labor conditions. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. You. My, I got a message about my internet connection. Okay. So it speaks to labor conditions and garment factories and it's massive and the detail of it is the way it was created is fascinating. Um, it's currently housed permanently in the permanent collection at the Museum of Arts and Design, which is very appropriate. So I'm going to play the video, this um, segment of the video. All right. Away at my sewing machine, and I always listen to the radio when I'm at the machine. And Charlie Kernigan, the director of uh, the Institute for Labor and Human Rights, was giving an interview, and he was describing the appalling treatment of these garment workers at a plant in Nicaragua where the women were forced to work 14 to 17 hours a day, six and seven days a week. Immediately, I knew I wanted to do something to help them. So I was walking through a department store and I'm seeing these huge signs, you know, that say Ralph Lauren, Eddie Bauer, Calvin Klein, We've all seen these signs. And then I remembered these women and I thought, yeah, but what are their names? And it seemed like the obvious thing to do would be to create a portrait, an identity, using all the little identification labels on the clothes that they make and we wear. I knew I wanted to base it on a real person that was in one of these factories. So I contacted the Institute for Global Labor and Human Rights and, and said, now, does Charlie Kernigan, has he got any photographs that I could use for this? Well, they very graciously sent me a couple hundred. And I just kept coming back to, the, to this one because this woman just had this calm, Poise. And so I start this process. I don't exactly have a, you know, a way to do it yet. But pretty soon I figured out, you know what, I, I'm going to need thousands and thousands and thousands of these things because it isn't just a matter of the numbers. It was a matter of finding, you know, the, the right tones, the right black, the right white, the right gray. And at some point it just took on a life of its own. And I started to get labels from all over the country. I started to get them from all over the world. I had no idea how people were even finding out about it. Every day I would go to my P.O. box and I think it's one of the most uplifting things that ever happened. You know, I would get these sweet notes from people. And the thing that blew my mind is that they took the time to go to their closet and cut the labels out one by one. To me, that's the strongest part of the whole piece because it's not just my opinion. It's a chorus of voices. It's a lot of people who are concerned about what's happening from all sides of the political spectrum. Somehow it's almost like schizophrenia. So I'm going to stop it there. All right. So that, I mean, I, I just think just her explaining her story. Sorry, can you see my PowerPoint now? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So just her explaining the story and how that, that piece all came together it was pretty fascinating to me. Um, I, when I first looked at this, this quilt, I obviously it was a picture of it. I originally thought this is like a, because some artists, what they do is they um, they actually paint or draw on canvas and then they go back and stitch it and that's a quilt. So I originally thought this was more of a drawing <laughs> in black and white and, and then there was stitching somewhere and when I actually saw that video and saw like, wait a minute, this entire thing is made strictly, everything in it made from clothing labels and I was just even more in awe. Um, of the work and how massive it is and how detailed and how it captures that original image perfectly.
And, and that was just fascinating to me. Um, so that's another example of even though um, multiple people didn't create the quilt, it still had contributions and collaborations from thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And again, I'll point out, this was 2005. I, I, I don't, I can't remember exactly what year Facebook and social media started, but this was before it was a thing, <laughs> before it was widespread. So she even said, I don't know how people were finding out about this, but it just goes to show the power of people and how we have the opportunity to come together, as she mentioned, across the political spectrum around the world for this one cause. And that's what makes this work even more powerful. Any, anything in the chat you wanted to mention before we move to the next one? Um, so your audience is absolutely um, blown away by this particular quilt. And, and we are As was I. For finding the <laughs> video, finding this quilt in this woman's work. Um, so the other thing that's very interesting is we have one after another saying, awesome idea, we should do this. Another, mm -hmm. uh, Roz says, I would absolutely do this. <laughs> and, and I say, we need to create a collaborative quilt. And Mia yeah. says, yes, count me in. Um, yeah. And okay. I think none of us could even imagine when you first showed the image that it was mm -hmm. a quilt. I for sure thought it was a drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg mm -hmm. offers, that's incredible. Yeah, and then amazing. Mia is saying, how do we connect? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this one, all of the, I, I should have said this at the beginning, but all of the um, quilts that I'm showing here, either they were mostly in the public domain or um, had a Creative Commons license, or I was able to find or get in touch with the creator and ask permission. This one in particular, I didn't find contact information for her, but I was able to find the image on the museum's website that allows you to use it for educational purposes. So unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to interact with or talk to or email the creator, but that video said it all, it captured it all. Um, and that video is in, um, it's just one segment of um, an episode of Craft in America, which is a PBS show. And it was, um, so you can find it on YouTube, but I've also linked to it here. So when you get the, the PowerPoint, you can actually watch the whole episode. And she, it features some of her other quilts too that also speak to um, some other social justice issues as well. And, so, Angela, if I could just uh -huh. um, interject here. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you are offering to share the PowerPoint with the yes. um, participants. So yes, I have so much lots of links that I would love for people to go to and, and, and take a look at. So All a lot right. of resources here. Perfect. All right, this next one called Solutions to Climate Change. And I have this photo here so you can kind of get a sense of the magnitude of it uh, with the people in it. It's eight feet high, 14 feet wide. It was created by a woman named Ula Nilsson who started learning about climate change when she was, as she had a toddler, she was pregnant with her second child, started learning about climate change and, and the impact uh, we were having on the environment. And she really honed in on this 350. Sometimes this is referred to as the 350 quilt. And that 350 represents the, the 350 parts per million we need in order to be safe, parts per million of carbon we need in order to stop, reduce climate change or reduce the impact of climate change. And she got the idea to create a quilt, and a lot of the pieces are hers, but what she would do is she would go to public parks, libraries, places in the community with her markers and materials and square blocks, and she would invite people to come and create a block that speaks to what are some things we can do to reduce our carbon footprint, and she put those together into this quilt. So that's another example of ways that we can bring other people in to contribute. So even though it's her quilt and she did the quilting part of it, it's certainly a collaborative effort. And to go back to the idea of quilts being portable, I've seen photos and videos of this quilt in um, people who were engaged in marches and, and uh, demonstrations um, around climate change where this quilt is being carried like a banner. Uh, for example, in the the march. And so it's, it, you have the ability to do that with this, with a quilt that you might not be able to do with some other forms of visual art. 
um, I think I saw something in an article where it said her goal was to try and get this in the hands of Barack Obama, but I don't think she was very successful at it. Um, but, but still, many people have seen the quilt and certainly it has an impact um, on those who see it. All right, and that's just a zoomed in, I'm sorry, it's a little blurry, zoomed in um, version. It says, change your habits, commute by bicycle. Um, so there's several of these little squares where people made suggestions of things they could do to reduce their carbon footprint. All right. This next quilt called Death in the Desert. It is one of several quilts made in a series under the Migrant Quilt Project. And I have a link to the Migrant Quilt Project here. I also have a link to a video that's about an hour long, but well worth watching. Uh, the Migrant Quilt Project um, was a project that created by a group of women collaborators um, who live in, in Arizona, and it commemorates lives that have been lost along the Tucson border. And every year the Border Patrol collects data and information about people who were found deceased along the border. And they have the number, they have uh, their names if they're identifiable. Some of them they cannot identify because the remains have decomposed or there's no identification. And they collect data on that. So this group, this organization works with the, the um, Border Patrol to get that data. And sometimes they're actually able to get some of the personal effects of the, of the deceased because no one has claimed them or claimed their bodies. And they're able to get like some of the clothing and things like that. And these, what, what happens is for every year that they have data, a, a woman or, or I'm sorry, a quilter or a group of people volunteer to create a quilt that commemorates the people who lost their lives that particular year. And if you could see here, this date, it says from 10, 2010 to um, 9, 2011, that consists of a year um, that the data is collected. And you see this here in 183, that represents the number of, of deaths um, that were recognized for that year. The, up at the top, you see Los Desconocidos, which means the unknown. So if they're not able to identify the person by name, they write that as just to recognize the person. So you see that written over and over and over again in the quilt. That's how many people were not, they were not able to identify. Another thing is, you may notice this material here, the blue material is denim, because many of the people whose bodies are found, they often wear jeans because it has all the pockets and uh, they're able to carry things in the pockets. So that's very common. And you'll see several of the quilts in that series um, have, have actual denim, some of it from the actual um, uh, bodies that were found. They find all kinds of things in there that, because they really want to commemorate and recognize the, these, them as human beings and something about their lives. And so I think somewhere in the video, it talks about one of the quilts actually has a pocket from a pair of jeans and their pesos sticking out of it because they found money or pesos on the person and they wanted to incorporate that into the quilt. And so they tried really hard to make this quilt um, representative of the people and their lives. You might see over here, I think there's a rosary bead here uh, that they, they find those quite often, which says something about the faith of the people of the bodies that they find. Um, and so if you have a chance to watch the video, it's really very powerful and moving and you get a sense of um, what they do is they walk through all the different quilts that were made and they talk to you about the um, some of the decisions that the quilters made as they put certain things in it. For example, this particular quilt, if you notice here, a lot of the writing is smeared. That was by accident. Um, and the, the person who created it was actually going to do those over again and then decided, no, I'm actually going to leave these smears here because that actually says something um, and actually makes a statement and, and thought it was fitting. So you get to learn a little bit about why the creates the quilts were created in the way that they, they were in some of the decisions that were made to put certain elements into the quilts. So it's really very powerful, very moving. Um, the, the quilts are not, I think it dates all the way back to data from 2000, 2001, 
but they are not done in order. So when someone volunteers, they decide which, which year they're going to represent and then they're assigned and then they're sent uh, like whatever materials or artifacts that they might have that can be incorporated into the book. So very moving, very powerful project and really, and I think even though these numbers are pretty high, it only represents the number of bodies or the number of people who were found by Border Patrol. I think I read that. So there could be more, the numbers could be higher. And remember, this is just along the Tucson border. Okay. And that's just a close up, a little bit closer up of one part of that quote. Right, this next quote called Black, Brown, and White in Orange, um, created by artist Karen Maple, who is a modern quilt artist. And um, her quilt won second place in the applique category at a Modern Quilt Guild exhibit in 2018. And I'm pointing that out only because there are some elements in this quilt that really speak to the modern quilt movement. Um, in, in the quilting world, we have what we call traditional quilts that are usually um, specific kinds of blocks that are created. They follow a certain pattern. It's very symmetrical. Certain colors are represented. This quilt, what makes it modern, one is the colors, the use of certain colors. This, this orange here, you probably wouldn't find in a very traditional quilt. It's, it's considered a very modern, very bold color. If you notice the background is sort of this very crisp white, even some of the fabrics that have patterns, sort of that white crisp as opposed to like a cream or off-white, that's very modern. Some of these colors here, like you wouldn't find some of those colors in a more traditional quilt. And the use of this gray here, you see a lot of gray, white backgrounds, things like that in modern quilts. I did have a chance to um, email this creator and she said originally when she made this quilt, her goal was to make a statement about mass incarceration and the disparities in numbers between um, whites who are incarcerated versus um, African Americans and Latinx people. And she said as she started working on it and making it, uh, she started thinking about the question of how would people spend their time in prison. And so it sort of took on a different um, angle. And that's why you see each of the individual cells with people doing different activities. So even though she made that shift, there are many things in this quilt that in my opinion, make a very bold statement about her original intent about mass incarceration and disparities. The first thing that stood out to me is this one over here, where it's very clear that this person has either has hanged himself or is, has, was, has been hanged. Um, I have to say that because we know of some situations, unfortunately, where it's been questionable what happened to the person who was found hanged in prison. Um, I also noticed this one here, which I couldn't quite make out. And I said, is the person asleep? Are they all covered up? You can't really notice a distinct um, uh, figure. I said, well, maybe they escaped. <laughs> so not sure what's happening there, but that was something that made me wonder what's happening. You see people praying, people exercising, people reading, people sleeping. And then up here in this corner here is the only figure that's not in all orange. And I think we can all um, assume, make a, a conclusion about the, the race of the person here. And not only does that stand out, but if you notice the, the wall here, the fabric that the, the artist chose, very different from all the fabrics because this one actually looks like it's a window with trees outside, where the others are these enclosed sails. This one actually looks like there's some, yeah, it almost looks like a floor to ceiling window where you can look out and see nature. So even though she took that, went in a different direction here, I think she made some pretty bold um, choice, some, some choices that make a very bold statement about the disparities. This one is just a little bit of a close up. There are a couple where I can't quite figure out, but I think this one, it almost looks like they're holding something to their head, like a gun or something, but I can't quite make out what's happening there. But clearly there's, there's something, I don't know what thought, are they brushing their teeth? But it, it's almost like some of these things you can kind of imagine or make more than one possible guess about what's happening to this person when they're incarcerated. So it, it speaks to not only um, the disparities, but also I think the mental toll that it takes on people when they're incarcerated. And the last quote here 
this is actually my quilt <laughs> that I created in this, this past spring. And it's called In Spangard. And I gave it that title because at a time where we were in the middle of the pandemic and quarantined, well, not quarantined, but in stay-at-home orders, and I kept hearing about one incident after the other from Breonna Taylor to Ahmaud Arbery to um, George Floyd, just hearing about not only those incidents, but reflecting on some of the previous incidents that have happened in previous years. And I kept thinking, like, I felt helpless, and I kept thinking, I need to do something. I want to do something. I want to get in on sort of the conversation. And I, I thought back to a sermon I heard a few years ago where the minister said, when it comes to injustice, get in the fight, but fight on your level. And I kept asking myself, what is my level? Because usually when I'm moved by a cause, the first thing I do is write a check and donate money. And I said, that's not enough. <laughs> and then I saw a YouTube video from, again, Faith Ringgold, who I mentioned earlier, and she was talking about when she was first trying to get her work seen in galleries. And she took some of her work uh, to a gallery and the woman looked at her and said, um, you can't do that. And she said at the time, because she was mostly trained in European art style, she was creating still lifes and landscapes and things like that. And she said, the woman said, you can't do that. And she thought about what that meant. And she said, this was the 60s, 60s. Look around you, look at what's happening. That's what she needed to use her, her art and her talent to speak about what was happening you know, in society to her people. And I thought, I'm a quilter. That's what I needed to do. And that's what um, sort of led me to do this. So I, I went from, I, I, I call it inspire because I said I was inspired by my anger to create this quilt. Um, and it speaks to police brutality. Uh, this element here obviously is uh, a, a nod to what happened to, um, sorry, recognition of what happened to George Floyd. Um, the stars, it, it, it really does play off the flag, which again, Faith Ringel actually has a series of paintings called the flag series. And one of them is called the flag is bleeding. And that was kind of my inspiration point. Um, I created this quilt over the course of maybe three weekends. And when I finished the top and put it up on my design wall and I stepped away from it, and literally five minutes later, I logged on to the internet and started seeing the um, reports about Richard Brooks, the, the young man who was killed by a police officer in at the Wendy's parking lot. And I had made the decision to put this star here as anonymous uh, with just a dark profile because I said, this is gonna happen again. And literally, as soon as I finished making this top, that's when I saw those reports. And I said, unfortunately, it's, this star is no longer anonymous anymore. It could have been anybody, but um, I, I left it in the quilt initially sort of teetering because I wasn't sure whether to put it there. I said, I don't wanna be negative. Maybe, hopefully it won't happen again. And, and it, it happened again and it has happened, happened several times. So I, I created this quote really to just sort of recognize some of the people who've lost their lives to police brutality. And I wanted to respectfully acknowledge them, knowing that I couldn't put them all in because it was just way too many. Um, when I, as I was, as I started working on the quilt, I actually found um, on Instagram a call for quilts in an exhibit called Gone But Not Never Forgotten. And it's been curated by Carolyn Meslumi, who I mentioned earlier when I talked about that quote, a soft place to land. And she was calling for people to submit quilts that spoke to people who lost their lives due to police brutality. So I applied and entered and it was accepted as one of, one of 28 quilts in that exhibit. And so it's now on exhibit at the Textile Center in Minneapolis. And as a part of that, um, as a part of that exhibit. So this is my first juried exhibition. So Angela, so, that is just mm -hmm. so exciting that it's on mm -hmm. that it's on exhibit right now. Um, yeah, I wanna it'll just, be there till Christmas Eve, I think. Till Christmas Eve. All right, mm -hmm. so let me just read a few of the comments about your okay. uh, quilt. Okay. Uh, Mia says, um, what a beautiful piece. How long did it take you to do this quilt? You'll answer these, after. I'll go through mm -hmm. them and you'll tell us because people mm -hmm. wanna know. Uh, the quilt is so stunning. This is Denise. Choice of color, fabric, and placement of elements combined in such a powerful way. Carol says, this is amazing, Angela, so powerful. 
and Freddie writes, and there was a peaceful protest near the White House in DC, mm -hmm. and goes on to say, and placed Black Lives Matters in 16th Street, Northwest DC. Mm -hmm. Phyllis writes, a beautiful quilt. Thank you for sharing your work from your heart. Jennifer says, very moving quilt. Freddie, this quilt is beautiful and I love it. Uh, Roz says, incredible, Angela. Amazing, amazingly technical, but so poignant. Lynn says, I've just been sitting here taking this quilt in. Every little detail takes, a tur takes its turn to jump out and demand my attention. Carol says, visually, your clever title includes a subtle reference to the Star Spangled Banner. Tamara, so powerful. Phyllis, congratulations. Kimberly, congratulations. Uh, Navalette, this speaks volumes and is powerful. Greg says, thank you for the information about your thought process and creative process. Can you talk about the choice of the three smaller stars in the blue field? And I might stop there and have you answer the two questions about how long it took and okay. then a bit about the uh, choices. Okay. Um, about how long it took, people always ask me that and I always get stumped like, ah, oh, I don't know, because I, I, I don't usually pay attention to that. But this one I do know I worked on it over three weekends. And because I don't usually sew during the week, but on weekends, especially now that we're you know, can't really go very many places. I had a lot of time to work on it over the weekend. Um, but I will say, I did, when I'm working on a quilt, it spends more time in my head <laughs> than it does at my, my sewing machine. So I thought about it for a while. And when I finally had the idea together and I did a rough sketch for it, that's when I saw the call for quilts. And I said, oh, this is perfect timing. Um, and it gave me, I think that was in June. And then the deadline to submit was the end of July. And so it gave me a hard deadline where I had to get it done. So it was, that was actually pretty, um, it was, it was a blessing <laughs> that, that it, it was announced or that it came at that time. So that's just uh, a little bit about that. Somebody mentioned the, the title also sort of referencing the Star Spangled Banner. And, and I said that, I actually thought about that. Originally, I was going to call it in Spangled for that very reason. And then I said, no, I'm just going to, I'm not even going to put the flag part in, the Spangled, the Star Spangled Banner part in. So I did think about that. And that was a part of, partly because I was inspired by those, those flag, the flag um, paintings by Faith Ringgold. So I was going to do that. And, and I made the decision to take it out because I didn't want, even though it was inspired by the flag, I didn't want the title to reflect um, the reference to the flag. So I, I changed it to Inspangered instead. Um, someone asked about the three stars. I think, I guess they were talking about these here. Yes, yeah, so I think it was Greg asking about how is yeah. it that you chose to do those three along with the, um, mm -hmm. the anonymous. Right. Um, I, it's funny because when I show this to my sister and brother, they were debating <laughs> on, on a text message about what those stars meant. <laughs> and it was kind of funny to watch them. And it's like, I'm in the middle of doing something. I can't answer you right now. But um, it, a couple of things. The first thing is, I, I, because I was thinking about the flag, and obviously there are stars um, on the flag here. And I kept thinking, do I leave some stars there or do I make it without stars at all? In this, in this part. And I looked at it and I said, it's just blue if I don't put any stars in it. And my original thought was blue to me symbolizes hope. We often hear that color of symbolizing hope. And I said, well, if I run with that idea that there's still hope and I still have hope that, that things are, um, can get better, maybe I should leave some stars there. <laughs> and I didn't really gather that the stars were kind of going in this downward arc and I thought that, that that could make a statement all of its own and I thought there's hope there but for many people it's just sort of fading um, and so that's what those meant so everything that's above the red line doesn't have a name yet that means that there there is still some hope um, but again this one was kind of teetering because uh, it you know I, I, I'm not going to be naive and say that it's not going to happen again, but these three that are still there are just really represent the hope that things can get better. And, and that was the choice. I, I also forgot to mention, you can't read the names on the stars, but this one here, 
it actually says et al. Um, because I knew I could not add a star with every single name of someone who had lost their lives to police brutality, but I didn't want to leave any of them out. And so that was kind of my compromise to, to acknowledge that there are others as well. Um, and I don't know if you had another question. Did, it, did I answer them all? Um, those were the two uh, okay. areas, really. Um, okay. and, and you've talked about your creative process, which is just amazing. Yeah. This yeah. is a really beautiful piece. And I yeah. think it's fair to say we are all very proud of you for Thank the you. Work that you <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you. And it's very simple. I am not an artist. I could not do the, like the quote that Therese Agnew did. Like I, I, I have not no artistic training whatsoever. I'm more improvisational. And that's a good thing for me because Carolyn Mizlumi in an interview after this exhibit opened, she said she, did, unlike other juried exhibitions where people are literally judged on, you know, how, how well their points line up and precision and technique, she just looks for the story. And, and so that worked to my advantage. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, she said, is, if the quilt makes it through its rounds and doesn't fall apart, she's happy. <laughs> so she doesn't look for technical ability. She looks for like, what's the story behind the quilt? So fortunately there's a place for people like me who aren't so technical and artistic, but still have a story they want to share. Um, and that's the last quilt. I did do a, just a zoom in, that's a close up of, um, just one part where I, I stitched in, just let us breathe in, in this part here. All right, um, so those are the quilts. And this last slide I have here links to several resources that you might wanna check out if you are um, actually interested in learning more about quilts and social justice. Um, this one here, I would highly recommend checking out that website, Social Justice Sewing Academy, was started by a young woman, Sarah Trail, a young African-American woman who started this organization after she finished graduate school, and it is, they do some amazing work, and so she's really, um, you can follow them on Instagram, check out their website. They do a lot of work with students in the schools using sewing and quilting um, to speak to social justice issues. So very um, powerful organization. All right, so any more questions? Folks, this is your opportunity. We still have 15 minutes before the program uh, closes. So you can either put them in the chat box or put your hand up or shout it out. And, and while you're doing that, I will also, I'll go ahead and launch the poll, just because one of my outcomes was which, uh, um, to think about a couple of quilts that um, maybe speak to you or quilts that you could describe as examples of um, craftivism, activism. And so I'm going to launch a poll. And if you could just pick any two, I just have listed all of the quilts I showed here. And just pick a couple and we'll take a look at those results. In the meantime, if you wanna post questions in the chat, um, I'm happy to answer those as well. Angela, I mm -hmm. might've mentioned it, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but how long have you been quilting for? I made my first quilts in 2005, but I would not have described myself as a quilter back then. It's just something I did on a whim. And at that point, I only made little small quilts whenever somebody had a baby. It wasn't until 2012 when I joined a quilt guild and actually learned more about quilting and all the opportunities and resources and tools and gadgets and techniques out there that I really started quilting more seriously. So I would say I've been a quilter since 2012, even though I made quilts before then. And what advice would you give someone who's just starting out to quilt, who's never quilted before? What should I start with first? How should I approach it? That's a little tricky <laughs> because um, there are some people will give you this long list of um, materials and things you have to have. Um, I would say if you have a needle and thread and fabric, you can quilt. Um, and different people have different tolerance levels for ambiguity. I've never taken a quilting class and I don't follow directions very well and I don't follow patterns. I don't like using patterns. I create my own designs. And because of that, my work is a little unpolished, but that's just what works for me. I know a lot of people who there's no way they could do that. They have to have a pattern. So I would say it depends on how you are as a learner. 
and how comfortable you are with um, making mistakes and ambiguity and whether you need like explicit instructions versus being able to just jump in and do it. So I always tell people, if you want to quilt, just jump in and start cutting stuff up and stitching it together and, <laughs> and, and see where it goes. But that doesn't work for everybody. So I would say if, if you, I would say that if you really do want structure and guidance, sign up for a class. If you can't do that in the pandemic, check out YouTube videos. If you Google beginning quilting videos, you can find that. Um, find a, a quilting, basic quilting book. Like I have one from Better Homes and Gardens. I think it's called Basic Guide to Quilting, something like that. I would say start there. So it really depends on how much structure you have or how much structure you need as a learner and how, um, how comfortable you are with just trying things out and making mistakes. And like, I don't care if I make mistakes. If something, I look at a quilt and it's almost finished and I see a mistake, I just leave it there. There are other people who literally rip the whole thing apart just to fix that one little thing that didn't line up. So I, I would not do that. <laughs> so it really just depends on who you are as a learner. And what's your um, upcoming quilt? What's going to be your next quilt? Um, I have like five or six <laughs> in progress right now. And one that I'm working on right now is actually um, uh, a, a nod to my favorite NFL football player, Dak Prescott, who um, admitted back in the summer that he faced depression over during the pandemic. And then he also revealed that his brother, who died back in April, had committed suicide. And so it's a quote that speaks to mental illness. And he was criticized by a sports analyst and saying he shouldn't have come out and said that because it shows he's weak. And if he's the leader of the team, he needs to basically man up and not share that information. And I don't think anybody agrees with that. But um, I, I'm working on a, a, sm a small quilt that speaks to um, uh, be recognizing mental health and not hiding it. So that's what's actually it's sitting right next to me some of the pieces are cut up right now and it's kind of in the shape of a football field and i'm going to integrate qr codes that link to um uh websites uh where people can get help for mental health and mental mental illness and depression and things like that so that's my my next project <laughs> so i i just want to interject here or interrupt mm -hmm. um angela also did a really interesting quilt as a result of uh uh, study travel to Japan. Mm -hmm. And Angela, if you could just tell us about some of the um, things you wouldn't expect necessarily to find in a quilt. Um, I know for sure when you said QR codes, I recall <laughs> that you had a QR code yeah. uh, that you created and yeah. what else was in that quilt? Um, I had a, I found these blinking lights and I embedded that behind like one of the blocks in the quilt is a, is the, you know, Japan's known as land of the rising sun. So I have a block that has like the big red sun and there's a blinking light behind it. Um, I found a sound box that I integrated, um, that I put underneath the, um, uh, what's it called? The, the robes that the geisha wear, uh, the name escapes me. Um, I integrated that under the under um, the robe, um, if the texture, integrated texture, and some QR codes. Uh, we, we visited a temple in Nara, Japan, that had um, these deer that would come up to you and try to get food from you. And if you bow to the deer, they would bow back. So one of the students on the trip with us took a video of me and the deer bowing to each other. So I have a QR code that links to that, to that video in the quilt. Um, so, um, Angela, somebody is wondering how to follow you. I understand that you're on Instagram. Do you recall offhand what your um, handle is on Instagram? It's called Angie Who Quilts. And is it a single word, Angie Who Quilts? I think there's an underscore between Angie and after Angie and who. Angie underscore who underscore quilts. Um, I think if you search my name, you might find it as well. Yeah, I don't have, I haven't been on Instagram very long and I just opened up my page last, maybe like a month ago um, to make it public. So yeah, there's not a lot going on there, but it's, it's there. <laughs> and it's only quilting stuff. I don't post any personal things there. Any other questions? Thank you for um, doing the poll. Thank you. Lots of good information here.
feel free if you haven't done so already, feel free to jump in. But that just gives me a sense of um, which things um, speak to people in different ways. Um, certainly they're all fascinating and, and certainly in, invite discussion and are, call people to think about different causes. So I think that's the main point. Angela, is the um, quilt show that your quilt is part of the one up in Minnesota, is it online? Yes, actually, I probably should put a, let me see if I could find the link. I can actually stop. You have it in the PowerPoint, right? Can you just click on it? Do I? Oh, yeah, you're right. I do have oh, it. Was it there? Phone. Okay, I missed yes. it then. But let's, let's and, go ahead uh, and yeah. open it. It's a good way to, to close out the event. Okay. Um, and, and I will I say, it is Angie underscore who underscores quilts, because I Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I forgot. <laughs> It is, if we have the time, yeah, this year. Ah, okay. Uh, can you see the, see the website? We, we see the highlighted website, but it's not opened yet. Um, oh, okay. Let me, let me do a new share then. Maybe you can copy it and put it into a search box. Oh, okay. there we go. Okay, you got it now. All right, I will. I'll put it in the chat as well. What you know, it's in the it's in the PowerPoint. Um, so this is the um, that's the website Textile Center, and and this uh, curator, it's a multi-site exhibit. So this is just one of them. Um, this exhibit has twenty eight um, quilts in it. There's another one. Um, I forget what it's called that she's running at that will open up in March at the same location that has about uh, maybe 60 quilts in it. And then there's others that were, that are, um, how do you say, like single artists, single solo exhibitions that are part of this bigger exhibition. And eventually she'll pull some quilts from each of those exhibits and they'll, they'll go into a traveling exhibit that I'll, um, that will travel over the next couple of years. So I don't know when I'm gonna get my quilt back. <laughs> it's, it's out of my hands right now. It's full, it, it gets to travel, but I can't. <laughs> so. Oh man, <laughs> but what an honor really. We're delighted that you have your quilt on exhibition. Yeah, um, the, yeah your audience is so happy. You're getting wonderful comments in the chat box. Thank um, you this everyone. This has been a really special um, time with you. Thank you for all that you do for your uh, creativity and for your genius, really. There's a there's such beauty in your work. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sharing your creative process. Thank you for the rich details and the research that you have done on this work with uh, social justice and uh, quilt activism. Uh, we are we're just honored to be in your audience today. Thank, thank you, Angela. Thank, thank you, you, everyone, for listening. Anytime sure. I, as I said before, like I love my job. I love working at MC, but I love quilting too. So to be able to bring those two things together and actually do quilting stuff at work is like heaven for me. So I appreciate you, Sarah and and Jennifer Ball, for giving me the opportunity to um, to do this. Um, folks, I just want to observe in this poll results that we have a lot, we have interests that go across the board mm -hmm. and, and it might be that you say there's something for everyone in quilting, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. right? They're just yep. a lot of happiness and meeting people's needs, uh, yeah. simulating yeah. intellectual, creative, and spiritual uh, responses. Yeah. yeah, and it's, I mean, it would be nice if we didn't have to make quotes like like these. <laughs> it would be nice if we could just make the, as, as Faith Ringgold initially said, make still life and nice pretty landscapes and happy things. But when things are going on around you and you have um, a medium or you have a, a, a talent, whether it's writing, music or whatever, it, it, it's almost um, sinful not to use it to, to at least speak about those things. So um, that, that's kind of where my head is right now. <laughs> So thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time and, and your wonderful comments and feedback. It's, that really inspires me.